Um, hi everyone. So many thanks for for joining us today. We will just wait one more minute that uh, uh, we reach the the four uh, four p.m. and that everyone can uh, can join uh, on time, and then we will start uh, this uh, this webinar on the, an exciting topic. So we just wait one more minute and then we can we can go. Okay, so I see there is more and more people joining. So, um, so we will start the introduction uh, of this webinar. So, uh, hi everyone. Um, many thanks uh, for joining us today in this webinar called uh, "Innovative Printing Strategies in uh, Robotic Additive Manufacturing." Um, so, this webinar is organized as part of the Soft Dream project. Uh, which is funded by the EIT Manufacturing. Um, so my name is uh, Anne Kerwe. I'm working as a project manager in Aerospace Valley, uh, a French cluster specialized in aeronautics, drones, and embedded system. So I will be today the, the moderator for this uh, for this webinar. And uh, first, I will just present you some uh, practical advice. Uh, so all the participants' microphone are muted. Uh, to avoid any background noise, but you can ask all your questions with this uh, with this question tab um, that you can see here on the picture. So really feel free to to ask uh, all the questions you have. Um, if you don't see the tabs, you can also write your questions through this uh, uh, email address uh, that you can see. And we will have some time at the end of the webinar to answer all the questions. Um, we are also recording this uh, webinar and the presentation will be available in 48 hours. So you will receive the, the links uh, directly per mail. And uh, if you have questions after this webinar, you can also contact uh, directly the speakers. So you will see their address email just uh, in the next slide. So I'm delighted today to present you uh, all the speakers. So the first speaker is uh, Emil Johansson. Hi, Emil. Um, so Emil is a research scientist in additive manufacturing at the Research Institute of Sweden. So he has an extensive experience in materials and process development, and is currently working on robot-based robot additive manufacturing of large-scale thermoplastic and short fiber composites, and is also the CEO uh, at the recently created startup Adaxis. Um, so uh, our second speaker today is Martin David. Uh, he is a scientist expert in uh, robotics and additive manufacturing at the Technical University of Braunschweig. And uh, besides working on SoftDream, he is also currently working on his thesis about uh, robot-based additive manufacturing in construction. And uh, our, our last but not least the speaker is uh, Geno Lebra. He's a robotic and additive manufacturing engineer at STIA, which is a French engineering and research graduate school. And he's also uh, the CTO uh, of the recently created startup Adaxis. So welcome to all the speakers. And uh, now I leave the floor to uh, Emile Joasson to speak about this uh, interesting topic of innovative printing strategies. Thank you very much, Anne, for this fantastic introduction. And uh, yes, so this is a, a webinar organized within the SoftDream Research Project. I will explain what this project is all about in just a minute. Uh, the idea about this webinar is that we will talk a little bit about the innovative printing strategies that are enabled by using industrial robotics for additive manufacturing. So uh, to sort of set the context a little bit, I'll talk first about how to use robotics in additive manufacturing, how it's done today. And then I'll explain a little bit about the research project um, that we have been uh, running now for the past um, one and a half years. And then we'll dive right into what can actually be done with robotics that is so exciting that we want to talk about today. So with that said, 
I will then skip right into the good stuff and talk about why you would like to use robotics in additive manufacturing in the first place. And uh, I have, you may be aware, and that's maybe the reason why you're also attending this webinar, that robotics has been the interest in using robotics for 3D printing has been increasing a lot over the last two years, uh, almost exploded in, in uh, usage in Europe. And uh, the reason for that is that it, it offers unparalleled flexibility in creating new kinds of complex parts, which is not necessarily possible using the traditional 3D printing methods that we've had before. And it's not an entirely new process, but we have seen a lot of really interesting new products coming out of uh, both companies and research institutes in the last couple of years. So here you can see some customized furniture, which is being produced actually now by Sculpture. It's a Swedish company and Reform Design Lab, uh, as well as a motorboat, which was printed last year by Rice and the um, a company Pioneer, it's a Nor Swedish Norwegian company. Uh, both of these products have been uh, printed using robotics, and as you can see in the boat case, you are really starting to use the uh, the possibilities of the robot. I will come back shortly to what that uh, what that can actually mean for for products. So why is it so interesting then? Well, first of all, since you can put whatever you want at the end of a robotic arm, you have full material and process flexibility. You can even combine it with other manufacturing technologies. Um, today, I believe concrete, metal, thermoplastics, composites, even food is printed with robo robotics in different uh, institutes and companies. They are very easy to scale and integrate into existing environments. And of course, there are a lot of robots on the market today, second-hand robots as well, which you could repurpose to become large-scale 3D printers. So it is a very interesting field also for, for um, environmental purposes and reuse of equipment. So when it comes then to the increased flexibility, the interesting part is that the robot is a six-axis system, uh, which means that you are able to manufacture parts not necessarily using horizontal layers, but you could also print on top of existing parts or use uh, angle printing, like in this case. Both of these examples are in a biocomposite material with a high content of wood fiber, um, and both of them are sort of for architectural applications. So with this, you're also able to think about things like part repair, uh, like printing to uh, to repair a 3D scan part, for example, and combining, as I said, additive manufacturing with subtractive methods, um, which could be easier to do with an industrial robot. So I want to take one um, purely industrial use case, which is also from uh, from sculpture. Uh, this, in fact, is a tool, a fixture for copper winding uh, for, for ABB, um, which was manufactured then by Sculpture, and they have manufactured it using angle printing in order to reduce the need of excess material. So they could reduce the infill, they could remove support structure, and they could also increase part uh, quality and performance. So it really shows that uh, with this technology, you can sort of open up uh, easier ways to print parts, which would otherwise be very time consuming to, to print. So then, uh, what is this Soft Dream project that we have been talking about? Well, it, a couple of years ago, we uh, um, how should I say? Yeah, I, I went to a research uh, matchmaking event and I knew that I wanted to work with robotic additive manufacturing, but I didn't know exactly what I wanted to work with. Um, 
And it turned out that at this matchmaking event for research projects were a lot of other people who were also working with robotic additive manufacturing, but maybe different materials, different robot brands. But everyone sort of had the same concern or the same problem, and that was that the software side of robotic additive manufacturing was not so evolved at that time. And that is now starting to change, but that was also the purpose why we created this research project, SoftDream, to create software and software tools that would make it as easy as possible to turn robots into 3D printers. Um, and as I said, the, the project has now been running for uh, a year and a half. It is funded by EIT Manufacturing uh, through the European Union. Union. And uh, we target then a number of different areas within this field. So everything from the design and simulation aspect and how you plan your process in a good way to generating advanced tool paths that we're going to talk about today. Um, we've also had a previous webinar last year, in fact, that specifically targeted real-time monitoring and for metals primarily. Uh, how do we check the process while it is running using vision inspection systems, for example, in order to understand if it's going well or not, not so well, and maybe correct uh, some problems that could occur. Um, and we are now also building this into a uh, toolbox and a software. So all of this, this sort of features that you see on the right side can be made available through different SDKs and Python bindings and REST APIs, and even a web interface that we have been developing. So uh, I'll just very quickly show you what it lo looks like. This is the web interface running now at the top right corner here, uh, where we are able to perform path planning for robotics. And then these tool paths can, for example, be directly imported into ABB Robot Studio and used to, uh, to program the robot. So it's uh, quite a flexible way to do things. Um, we have built in ability for a whole bunch of features like planner, non-planner, angled slicing, but also some process prediction and also traceability to keep track of, of previous process data. And uh, since one of the partners of the project is, is Volkswagen Group Innovation, we've spent quite a lot of time thinking about how to manufacture large-scale automotive prototypes, which are not necessarily designed to be 3D printed in the first place. But if you can 3D print them, you will save a lot of time in the product development process. So this is one example of a rear bumper for a Volkswagen Golf. And now, as uh, Anne was talking about, we have had the great fortune to be able to create a spin-out company of this, from this project called Adaxis. And I'll talk maybe a little bit about it at the very end of this webinar. Uh, but now I think we should dive right into the path planning aspect of robotic additive manufacturing. So uh, this slide is really just to show you that when we talk about path planning and tool path generation, it involves a massive variety of, of different approaches and different uh, parameters that you could set. Uh, everything sort of impacts the part quality and the, the, the uh, accuracy of the part. And we'll just touch upon a few of these in this webinar, but of course, everything is sort of joined together and equally important in the end. But today we'll talk about adaptive path planning and non-planner printing. And uh, these are just two, I mean, adaptive path planning and non-planner printing are just two ways in which you could perform path planning for 3D printing. Of course, there are a number of other ways, uh, but these are the ones that we will specifically target today. And then there are some advanced cases, of course, where you could combine multiple different strategies within the same part in order to achieve something which is even more complex. Um, but with that said, I will give the word, word to uh, Martin and uh, Feel free to start talking about this very interesting topic of adaptive slicing. Yeah, thank you, Emil. Um, 
Yeah, um, like Anne said in the beginning, I'm working um, in Softream here, and um, most of the time I'm working on the adaptive path planning. And um, the problem with the basic planning strategies in additive 3D printing, um, Emil, if you can go to the next slide, then um, we will see the two challenges that arises in normal 3D printing. Usually, you have the problem if you want to print like um, parts with um, uh, with a high uh, high infill density, you have like very high printing times. And the usual approach is to to decrease the infill density, to reduce the tool path, and um, at the end, uh, saving time. But the problem with that is that if you increase, if you decrease the infill density too much, then you weaken your part by quite a bit, and it's also problematic to print um, like very complex parts. Yeah. On the other side, um, you have um, a problem which is called staircase effect because. Um, Usually, you just print um, print apart layer by layer, and um, the problem with high layers is that um, the resolution, as you can see on the uh, on the right side of this slide, in the little left picture in the left perm permit, um, you see these little stairs there. The reason why you may choose a very high layer height is to save time, because with uh, um, with the lower layer height. You get longer prints, but in the end, a better resolution. And um, the solution we were um, thinking of to solve like these two challenges and maybe combine them into one strategy is um, this adaptive path planning. And, um, if you go to the next slide, you see the two solutions we came up into um, in, in the project. Like the solution for the reduction of printing time could be not only increasing the layer height, but also increasing the bead width by maintaining the same speed, the same printing speed. And with that, as you can see on the left side, you can, um, yeah, you can decrease the part length of one layer by quite, um, by, by quite some time. And um, the challenge with these um, staircase problem or with uh, decreasing with the decreasing resolution by saving time is that you could try to um, to connect the resolution to the layer height. So, like there's a quite simple um, a quite simple equation um, which you can see here on the um, bottom right. You can um, you can link the layer height of each layer to the required resolution in this layer. So if you, for example, have like a half sphere or a part with some details, then you could decrease the layer height in areas where you need a higher resolution, for example, to build like some details or like a very shallow um, shallow surface. You can just use, um, yeah, you can just use like quite fine, quite, quite small layers there and um, yeah, to, to build up this resolution, to, to get the res resolution you need. And in areas where you have, for example, steep walls or, um, yeah, or areas where resolution is not needed, you could just use the high, these, these high layer heights. And so that in the end, if you combine everything together, you can get a printing time that is like not on this, on this line you see on the, on, on the right side, but um, above, so you get a better, better resolution in less printing time. And um, to show you a little bit how this could impact the path planning, um, we like I, I prepared the next slide here. On the left side, you see a part that was um, printed by Rice. This is, um, I think, it's a water container, um, yeah, which is used for rainwater or for or other stuff. And the thing you see here on the left side is that you have like very high walls and just some areas where a high resolution is needed. And with this adaptive slicing, you can um, identify these these areas and um, yeah, and slice them adaptively to their required resolution. And how this path, this uh, two paths um, could look, you could see in the middle with some some details here on the right. 
these um, these steep walls with high layer heights. You can see here in this um, in this violet square the detail um, the detail here um, yeah on the on the top right. Um, yeah, so like in these areas you save you save up very much you, yeah you save very much time by um, by using the maximum layer height which was here chosen by five millimeter and to get like the resolution which is needed for these curves or um, or also for some um, like shallow surfaces you could use the layer height of one millimeter and the program that we have developed um, decides when to use which layer height to get like the maximum resolution in the minimum in the minimum of time but the thing is you have to keep in mind that um, if you decrease the layer height you get like quite many lines of code like for for this part here the lines of code were around 900,000 and uh, the whole file was around 45 megabyte big so it's not that easy to um to handle for the robot but like that's another problem that um, we also have to um, address here in this um, project. But like, that's just one solution, how you could um, improve the quality and the time. Yeah, you can go to the next slide. Um, and um, the next idea we have and what we're working on is not only to increase the layer width in every layer, but also to, um, to combine infill layers together to get like a higher infill um yeah to to get like higher layer heights in this in the in the middle of the part where it's not responsible for the for the resolution of the part and um by this yeah as you can see as um, Emil is showing right now you can see on the left uh, on the top left um this is a part sliced usually like normally with uh, without these strategies and on the right side it's the same part um, cut it at the same height and you see you have reduced the the two path lengths by quite a bit and if you yeah if you use the same printing speed for both of the parts you of course get like yeah a massive reduction in um, in printing time but in the end um, there are also some things that we learned by um, by also printing um, some of the code we generated. And the first thing you have to remember that um, you have to know the parameters. So the thing is that the beat the beat height and the beat width is um, highly dependent on the robot speed on and on on the flow rate of the material. So if you have like a specific robot speed and a specific um, and a specific flow rate, you have to um, to put the nozzle height, like the distance from the nozzle to the printed uh, printed surface. You want to put like another layer on. You have to put it specifically at specific height, and um, that's why you have like to know the parameters. And we think that for every extruder you use, you need to identify these parameters. The next thing you have to keep in mind is that um, physics still applies. Like, of course, it's like um, it's like obvious. But the thing is that um, if you generate two parts, it's not um, guaranteed that um, you can really print these um, these two parts because, as you see here on the middle picture, or even on the picture on the right, um, yeah, you cannot print into thin air. Or if you choose like a flow rate that is too less, you get some um, yeah some cavities and some holes into the part. And because of that, you need to know the parameters and keep in mind that um, the physics still applies and you can't do magic. Although we all want <laughs> to um, yeah to work against physics. Okay, um, this was the presentation on uh, adaptive path planning, and now. Um, I'm giving the presentation back to Emil, who's talking about the non-planet. Yeah, and uh, basically what do you do then if you do want to print in thin air? Well, then obviously the, the logical thing is to think about not printing in uh, 2.5D, which is horizontal layers, 
but in fact to extend it into 3D with six axis printing. And this is what I will talk about lit, uh, a little bit here. So first I want to show you something which is quite popular these days and it's called angled slicing. It's basically a way to, to use a six axis system or a tilted extruder in order to reduce the need of support structure or infill. So in this case, as you can see, we are able to print certain horizontal overhangs without anything below. So we are able to print, so to say, in thin air. But this is in fact just a sophisticated two and a half D printing. And it's not in fact the best, necessarily the best way to use the robot if you want to use all of the uh, external axis, uh, all of the axis of the robot. The next step then is what if we go completely away from the concept of, of planner toolpaths. So on the left here you have the uh, classical Stanford bunny uh, sliced with horizontal, uh, horizontally to give horizontal toolpaths. And as you can see you have the staircase effect, it's visible quite, um, quite a lot. On the right on the other hand we have used geodesic distance field to generate toolpaths following the contour of this part perfectly. And as you can see, there is no real staircase effect. It follows the surface perfectly. Now, in theory, this looks like it would be the perfect way to print this part, and it might be, but as uh, Martin just pointed out, physics still apply. So uh, we gain a lot of uh, possibilities with the concept of printing completely non-planner toolpaths, but we also gain some complexity in terms of what is actually possible. So, um, I mean, the, the reason why you would want to do this in the first place are quite easy to visualize. I mean, here you can see very clearly that for a certain part, you might have a very dramatic increase in uh, resolution because you completely remove the staircase effect you will probably have a lot better performance of this part as well. Um, on the other hand, if you look at the right, um, if you go for, for printing something which is a non-planner, then if you're working with a regular gantry-based printer, pretty soon you will end up with some problems because the extruder is not being tilted, so it will hit the part, print, parts you have printed previously. Like here, for example, it's uh, very likely to, to cause problems here. But if you have a six axis system, then you can position the extruder with some more freedom in order to deposit material in a more optimal way. So then that brings me to the non-planner slicing strategies. And in fact, there are a number of these. Uh, not all are born equal, not all of them are useful in every kind of situation. So I'll go through a few of the popular ones. Now, now the first one would be quite intuitive. It is in fact just using two meshes, one substrate, one part, and then you slice the part with the substrate and you continuously offset the surface of the substrate to generate intersection lines um, progressively farther away from the original substrate until you have built up your entire part. In this case, it's quite easy to see because it's a cylinder and it's a, a cube. Um, of course, this uh, poses some complexity in terms of calculation. Um, if you're not slicing something with a plane, then you need to perform an awful lot of intersection tests in order to generate these toolpaths. But of course, you can use some hierarchical data structures in order to reduce the intersection tests to a manageable level. And then this, this is possible. So this is a good solution if you have a 3D scanned part, for example, and you want to print on top of it, then you, you will need to generate um, offsets continuously and, and slice your part with another mesh. Uh, another very popular thing to do is that you select the top surface of a part and then you project a 2D pattern on top of it. This would be a very clear cut case. You have a cylinder and then you have lines. You can 
think of it as these lines have been previously in 2D and then you have just projected them on top of this 3D part. Now this works very well for certain uh, com components but and certain geometries, but if you have a complex component, then this 2D projection is not really going to work that well. So um, there are some other op options here, I will get to that just in a minute. Now the good thing is that if you think about combining horizontal slicing and projecting this 2D pattern on top, you can in fact reduce the staircase effect very efficiently just by overlaying the top surface with this extra material like what we saw here. But as I said, it's not really possible for very complex geometries. So then what do we do if that is the case? One popular strategy to generate non-planar toolpaths that I've seen a lot, especially on LinkedIn, is geodesic fields, geodesic distance fields. So basic, the concept is very simple to understand or very basic in, it, in that sense that you think of that you have a, a mesh and then you select a point on that mesh and you gradually generate offsets, curves, like these lines on this image here, for example, on an equal distance from the, the origin until you have reached the end of your part. So it is a way to generate toolpaths on top of a 3D surface where these toolpaths are all at the same distance from each other. So you end up with, in theory, very nice toolpaths that will be able to achieve what you can see with this turbine, uh, this propeller blade here, for example. So this one here we have selected the origin is just simply the bottom of this, this blade, and then we generate the, the toolpaths offset from this origin. And if we then generate toolpaths for, for, based on this, we can see that we can build the part outwards from this origin, which is very convenient. Now, the, the problem is of course still that some complexity is very difficult to handle because um, if you have small features, you might have some very strange behavior in the toolpaths. It works very well for relatively simple parts like this. But let's say that you would have, for example, the, uh, uh, the Stanford bunny, where you have the ears and everything. Uh, you quickly end up in a, a situation where you get some problematic areas. I will show you exactly what that looks like uh, in just a minute. Now we could then combine these two strategies. For example, if you want to print on top of a surface, you could Instead of projecting a 2D pattern onto the surface, you could generate the toolpaths using these geodesic distance fields. And what this would look like is something like this. So imagine that you have a double curved part like this panel here, or it could be a mold tool. And then you might want to repair it. It has been damaged in this section. So then you could perform a manual or automatic surface selection. Um, Basically, you could automatically detect it by looking at the curvature of the part and you could select this surface or you can select it with a mouse, for example. Then you select an origin, for example, it could be this corner here. So you want to print paths outwards from this origin and then simply by generating this geodesic distance field, you could, you could extract these kind of contours here. Um, which then, if you also extract the orientation of, of the surface of the part, then you can orient your extruder, or in this case, this metal deposition tool, uh, so that it prints norm in a normal direction from the, the surface. So I'll just quickly show you one thing that we are actually currently printing. So this is a model of a rocket nozzle. And as you can see, I will just quickly stop here. We have selected this uh, bottom edge as the origin and we want to generate toolpaths outwards from this until we reach the end of the part at the top. 
and then it will look something like this. So you can see that the toolpath is very nicely now following the curvature of the part and we are also able to extract the orientation of the tool. Now this is a rocket nozzle and I know that they are not supposed to be made out of flammable material which is why I'm so proud to present that we are now maybe the first in the world to print a rocket nozzle in biocomposite so it will for sure be a one-time only component and it is of course not uh, it's like a, an experiment obviously but it's what you can see in this uh, right picture here that we are in fact now printing it and it works very well now when you print horizontally everything kind of works as expected most of the time and if it doesn't you can tailor the parameters relatively easily so that it does work but as soon as you start to move the rotation of the material deposition unit um, then you will end up with a lot of strange behavior or maybe they are not so strange if you think about it now typically if you have a miss alignment of the extruder or the material deposition unit compared to the the programmed alignment like the tcp position here uh, the tool center position if you have a misalignment there typically for horizontal printing you don't really notice it uh, and if you have some inconsistencies in the flow rate it might be okay but if you start to rotate the rotate the extruder you very quickly realize that uh, in fact the extruder that we thought were was perfectly calibrated uh, is is not and you end up with a lot of blobs on the surface and it looks very quickly even with small problems you it starts to look very unappealing you also need to make sure that you have sufficient resolution if you think everything in 2d uh, and you want to go from point a to b uh, it's very easy you can have just one line segment between the two but if you want to go from point a to b and there's supposed to be a curvature in between then you need to have sufficient resolution to give the robot a nice smooth movement. And here is uh, one thing that I touched upon previously, that the toolpath orientation must be of high quality. And I will show you exactly what it looks like if it is not in high quality. Uh, we can just maybe first look at this. This is what it's supposed to look like. So uh, you have this. A, a calibrated TCP, you have a perfect resolution of the line segments, the interpolation of the robot is, is looking very good, and the material is being deposited as it's supposed to be. But what happens then if you end up with a poor quality toolpaths? Well, then it could look something like this. And basically you are sort of left with it, whether or not the mesh that you're working with, if it is a mesh, if that is good, then you are good to go. If it is not good, then you can end up in this situation here. So, I mean, I've talked a lot about thermoplastics and that's because that's my area of expertise, but it's always very interesting to understand how does this extend to metal 3D printing and directed energy deposition. And for that, I will give the word to Ginole, who is much, much more knowledgeable about this topic than I am. Thanks, Emil. Thanks, Emil and Martin, for, uh, for the presentation of these two advanced uh, pass planning. So, yeah, I will just present you some consider consideration uh, we have to take for metal printing, but also for robotic printing. So, first of all, if I start with the adapti adaptive slicing uh, Martin just presented you. Uh, so, of course, we understand that the advantage are the better near net shape and it uh, also limits the risk of staircase effect. But the most difficult aspect for metal printing is the working set uh, of parameters. So, it, it means the calibration of the process currently. Uh, if we, for example, took a one process, so an acquired deposition process, we have the, the three main uh, parameters, which are the power, the travel speed, and the way of fit speed. And depending on this, just this triptych of parameter, there is some uh, 
quite a few uh, working sets. So for example, uh, I illustrate here on the, on the fake image, but just to give you uh, yeah, an image of it. Uh, so of working parameters. So if we need to do some adapt adaptive slicing to have a, a variation of the layer eight, for example, it would be quite hard to trigger, uh, well, to select the good variation between uh, one layer eight to another in a continuous way as sometimes the working set of parameter is not continuous in terms of power or in terms of robot speed and everything. Uh, it is also worse when you have high temperature involved because with metal printing, uh, the thermal history of the part is very important. At some point, uh, some variation of parameter will work regarding a gradient of temperature. And if this gradient is too high, for example, so if you advance on the part and you have maybe a local uh, amount of temperature, then this, uh, this transition between two set of parameters might not work. So for that, it requires a very strong calibration of the process to identify uh, regarding the temperature, but also the time we have printed. Uh, of course, the material. So there is a uh, lots and lots of parameters we have to take into account. And so here you can see some trial uh, of adaptive slicing. So on the on the left, and uh, of course, we had a huge problem of parameters uh, regarding the transition. And currently, the funny fact is that we use exactly the same transition for the part on the left. But due to the, to the geometry, the transition, the thermal history was not the same. And so at some point, uh, we identified that this transition might work on certain geometry and not. So yeah, all of it to trigger that uh, the calibration is very important to use this kind of uh, pass planning for metal deposition. Then, uh, if you can switch, I mean, Thanks. Then for the non-planar slicer, so of course the advantage is to repair, to add functions. So Emil uh, give a, and Martin give a bunch of examples, which are very well uh, welcome to, to be applied in, in uh, additive manufacturing for metal deposition. For example, to repair molds, to repair blades, to repair lots of, uh, of parts, but also to add some functionalities. For example, if you have a part and you just want to maybe uh, add a new sensor or a new I don't know, a new functionality on this part. It's possible to print directly on top of it. So it has a very nice application in the end for metal deposition. But uh, here, the main difficulty is, of course, there is also, uh, always the, the um, process parameters and calibration. But here is more a, a mechanic, a robotized aspect and uh, linked with the process aspect regarding the angle of the, the orientation of the torch. Because for metal uh, printing, it, will, it is very less, uh, it is not possible as in, in polymer to uh, orient, for example, at 45 degrees the printing. Well, I mean, it, will work, it might work for maybe 10 layers and sometimes collapse. Once again, it's depend, lots of dependence on the, on the material, on the robot using all the, the parameters we choose. But yeah. So it presents some difficulties uh, we need to, to, to work on. Then you can switch, Emil. Then the, some thoughts about so the, the robot axis. So we, we have made some trial to print not horizontally, so with using the, currently the five axis of the robot because the tool was omnidirectional. And uh, as Emil said just before, the TCP, TCP calibration is very important. For example, if you have the TCP for horizontal printing, if it's quite offset, uh, maybe on the plane, it will have just an offset of the part uh, somewhere, but the part will print well. But uh, if you start to play with the orientation of the tool, then you can uh, finish in this kind of configuration on the top left uh, corner image. And so here we can understand well that uh, in polymer it will not work, but if there, if there is some people working in metal, it's sure that it will not work either. Because the gravity is more uh, more uh, strict with a uh, metal deposition, I'd say, uh, due to the uh, melt pool and uh, every thermal aspect. Uh, then uh, there is uh, to combine this uh, the problematic of uh, the um, the orientation of the tool. We also provide we are also work a little on the external axis to. Uh, uh, allow more uh, difficult part to print. For example, if we have an, an angle of 25 degrees, so if you try to print this kind of geometries with an horizontal torch, uh, I'm pretty sure in metal you will not succeed. Well, of course, it depends on the resolution, but um, it will be quite hard. So to add the process and to not uh, uh, print a lot of support material 
uh, or infill material, then we can use this kind of external positioner to uh, to print some uh, this kind of chip with the robot and simplify at, at the end the uh, robot movements. But uh, as for the positioner, the, as for the TCP, uh, sorry, the positioner might need to be very well uh, calibrated. So for that, there is already some techniques existing for the milling and everything. But we need to apply this uh, this kind of calibration techniques for the uh, for the additive, additive manufacturing. It is mandatory to to enable this kind of uh, of fast planning. And uh, yes, and you can go on the next slide. So, uh, I, yeah, this part was mainly to spot the difficulties we have to enable this advanced fast planning because they trick some very, very nice interest uh, on the software. So now we need to enable them uh, on the creation of, on the building of some real parts. So for that in SoftDream, we are mainly working on the process calibration uh, for AM deposition in metal. Uh, so for that, uh, we designed a test bench to standardize the testing. So using uh, some sensor as a pyrometer, telemeters, thermal camera, in order to record uh, lots of data currently, to identify which are the best parameter, what is working or not regarding the thermal history and everything. And once this, uh, I will simplify and say, ABAC is created, then to use this ABAC as an input uh, data in the path planning strategy. So for the um, for the adaptative slicing, for example. Then another aspect, so regarding the uh, more the um, robotic uh, calibration, is to apply calibration test uh, techniques for additive manufacturing. So we try to explore some uh, scan 3D and mapping to overlap uh, the real parts and uh, what we need to achieve in order to. Uh, uh, I'd say that to generate the, the path planning in the right place uh, from the robot environments. And uh, we also explore the calibration based on, on more probing techniques, which are very used in a traditional meaning. And currently, the part on the left, on the bottom left here, we just print uh, this afternoon. Uh, I didn't have the time to upload the picture. But uh, yeah, we, we managed to recalibrate the position of the real parts in the 3D scene. And to directly print uh, on top of this uh, on this uh, roof shape currently, and uh, and we use currently the also the non-planar slicer to generate the the, uh, the pass planning of this uh, little added added function on top of this roof. Yeah, thanks Emil <laughs> for the mouse. <laughs> Yeah, so that's uh, currently the work we are doing in Sodrim, and I hope I can uh, I will be able to say more about it in the next webinar if we have one in September or at the end of the year uh, to show some of these results and analytics. Thanks a lot for uh, for listening. Thank you, Ganola. and uh, it's of course a lot of very interesting topics that we are dealing with in this research project, and uh, already from the start when we started out working with this we knew that if it was possible we wanted to see if we could bring some part of this software to market and then now in january this year we were able to uh, sort of make this dream a reality and start a spin out company called adaxis and uh, i'll just very quickly say something about what we are doing so the overall scope of what adaxis is about is to make it as easy as possible to turn robots into to 3D printers for any kind of material that you can think of. And the idea is to be as robot agnostic as possible. Now what this actually means is that we are developing a software suite or a software platform with a, for example, this desktop software here that lets you program any robot as a 3D printer to perform process prediction and to the idea is to make it as easy and as and as intuitive as possible because obviously you can you can spend a lot of time writing python code and you can achieve fantastic things but uh, it takes quite a bit of time and quite a bit of dedication to get to that level uh, what we want to do is to put this at the fingertips of anyone who want to to work with robotic 3d printing and uh, we also attach some real time monitoring to make sure that we can check where everything is, is going well. So we have a real-time monitoring module and we also provide a web interface where it's possible to, uh, to check 
if things are running smoothly to log manufacturing data, log material data, etc. And uh, it's uh, quite interesting, of course, because we launched this company now during the COVID pandemic and it's an international company. So we have uh, our head office in uh, Bidar in south of France, southwest of France, and uh, a branch office in Gothenburg. So it has been, of course, a very interesting uh, experience to launch a company when, when we are located in two different countries. And uh, if you are interested in what we do and you want to check out more, uh, you can find us on LinkedIn. You can, of course, contact us and just to see if it's possible for us to find some use case together. Uh, and of course, if you have found something interesting in this webinar, uh, feel free to contact any one of us uh, speakers. Uh, you can go to our website, uh, softdreamproject.eu. And um, if you get in touch, we might be able to come up with some uh, interesting demo case or provide you with some interesting tool paths or, uh, or work a little bit together to, uh, to try out some interesting things. And with that, I will give the word back to Anne to open the floor for uh, possible questions. And yes, so thank you. Thank you, uh, Enil, Genoué, and Martin, for this really, really interesting uh, presentation and with all the interesting content. So, um, so you can still uh, ask your question in the in the question tab uh, that you have with this webinar. Um, there is a first question. So, how long did it take to print uh, the the boat and to print the bumper, uh, the car bumper? And can you estimate the time saving with the angle printing? Uh, yeah, uh, I can, well, sort of, I can do that. So the bumper, it took about eight hours to print it. And uh, with the angle printing, we were able to reduce the support structure that was needed. I don't have any sort of estimate for the bumper where how much time we saved, but it might have been uh, at least uh, 30, 40% or something like that. Now with the boat, it gets even more interesting because uh, the print itself, as it was shown here, it took about three and a half full days to print. Um, and what you have to consider here that is that it's, even if you have a high throughput, throughput extruder, like uh, 35 kilograms per hour, it might not be possible to print at that high speed because of physics and the cooling of the material. So in fact, we could probably have printed it a bit faster. But the boat itself, I believe it weighs right now about uh, 300 kilos or thereabout. And we used 11 kilos of support material. So you can imagine then the massive saving in, in uh, print time that we get. We might have been forced to use in the region of 250 kilos of support material if we had not printed it with angle printing. So then it really, you can really understand that you could maybe even half the printing time or more, which I think is pretty exciting. So I hope that answered the, the question. Yes, very, very impressive indeed. Uh, so thank you for, for the answer. So I can't see any more questions in the question tabs. So um so yes thank you again emil for the for the answer so if you have more questions you can contact uh, uh, one of the speakers and uh, they will be more than happy to to answer your your questions further so again so this uh, this webinar is recorded so you will receive all the link to the presentation and to the recording and uh, per mail after 48 hours and um, and uh, thank you, thank you again for all the speakers and all this uh, very uh, exciting and exciting information. And uh, then uh, see you soon for another webinar on uh, additive uh, robotic additive manufacturing. So many thanks, everyone, again. Yeah, thank thanks a lot for listening. <laughs> thank you. Have a nice day, everyone, and see you soon. <laughs> bye. Yeah, bye. 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 Bye.